PC, accounting for your future. Hi, this is Dave from AP Safe. So in this video, what I'm going to do is to talk to you about the basis of the conservation SFP. So, the basic knowledge of the consolidation group account, which is the statement of financial position, or you can call it as the balance sheets if you like. Okay. So, when talking about the basis of the consolidation SFP, there are particularly two things I'd like to talk to you about. So firstly, we are going to discuss with you what do I mean by control and secondly, about the significant influence. Of course, there will be lots of other knowledge that you have to learn in the due course later on. But here I'm going to talk to you about this two basic concepts. So, uh, what do I mean by control? is what I mean by if we got more than 50% of shares we hold maybe 60% of shares of another entity so we control that entity but what does that mean? it means that for example in a board resolutions for example if we vote for 60% of yes says although another company so the one that we haven't got control may vote 40% of shares surely we can pass the board resolution we like to pass any of these decision to make any decisions that we want so let me go let me go to give you an example so for example let me just write down here so we are this company and we control that company so we own 60 percent of shares and we want the company b to go into the singapore market so what I'm going to do is that within the board uh, within the board meeting, we're going to vote for 60% yeses that we're going to go to Singapore market, even though another 40% may say, no, we cannot go to that market. Of course, it's more than 50%, yeah, more than 50% that we, that we can pass the board resolution. Surely, we can pass any decisions we like. We can make any decisions we want. So that's what I mean by control, okay? So that's just the basic idea behind that. So from this perspective then, if we've got control of another entity, surely we are going to consolidate that account into our financial statement. So what I'm going to do is to show you the basic idea behind the SFP. So we've got the first company, SFP. We've got the asset number one, liability number one, also the equity number one we control the company two it's got the asset number two liability number two as well as the equity number two so the basic idea behind the consolidation SFP is we simply plot them together that would give us the consolidation account consolidation SFP so within the consolidation SFP, it simply say we've got the asset one plus two, we've got a liability one plus two. The simple idea behind it is, for example, within the asset number two, we've got the machinery. If we've got control over the company two, of course we can control that machinery. This means that we can use it in anywhere we want by passing the board resolution you understand that so from this perspective they although we only own 60% of shares of another entity but we control 100% of those assets and liabilities so that's the reason why we are going to plus all of these assets together even though we own less than 100% of shares of another entity that's the simple idea behind it but what about for the equity? Well, for the equity, the rule for the consolidation SFP is that we're going to show the equity number one onto the consolidation SFP. 
And secondly, we are going to replace the re equity number two with a name called the non-controlling interest, which is the NCI, to reflect the fact that will be the uh, element within the equity number two. That's the basic idea behind that. But you now get a little bit confused of what's going on. So the rule is, behind the consolidated SFP, when consolidating the equity figure, we are based upon the ownership rather than the uh, control definition. So let me just to explain the rationale when, uh, after I give you the example uh, later on. So we are discussing about the control Okay, so let me just to give you an example. If one company owns 100% of shares of another entity, let me show you the payment process for examples just to see how we're going to account for it. So if we own 100% of shares, if you want to own 100% of shares, we like to spend maybe money, cash, to pay for the shares, pay for 100% of shares of the target company. So what we're going to do here is that maybe we're going to say we're going to pay $10 to acquire the 100% of shares of another entity. So that the entity's asset, or you call it as the net asset, this means maybe the other entity may have the property plants and equipment, also have the payable balances as well. So if I'm going to take the PBA minus the payable, which is the asset minus the liability, that will give us the equity of a target company. So the equity of a target company is what I mean by net asset. So in this case, of course, I'm going to make up a figure. For example, I assume that the target company's net asset is to be five. So that's so you can say, the target company is actually worth $5 but we pay for them $10. What does that mean? It means that, well, to some extent, we make a loss, haven't we? Because it's only worth five, but we pay 10, we pay for more than it should be, so it's not good for us. So from this perspective then, from the accounting's point of view, the excess amount of money of five, which is 10 minus five, will be recognized as a goodwill, as the intangible asset. So, what do I mean by intangible asset? What do I mean by goodwill? It's simply like this. Because the PBA within the company, minus the payable, for example, actually gives us the net asset figures to be five. It is just the net asset within the company. But some of the asset within that company maybe cannot be touched, yes? Such as the brand name, such as the slogan, such as the customer relationship, such as the supply relationship, such as reputations. So maybe we buy another company, not only we're going to buy its cash, not only we're going to buy the PPA within that company, not only we're going to buy the receivable, but also we are going to buy its reputation. So from this perspective, so we are going to pay the excess amount of $5 to acquire those intangible assets of the target company. So you've got this idea. So that's what I mean by goodwill. It, how we're going to calculate the goodwill is where we're going to compare the money we spend to buy the other entity with the value of the target company. So that the excess amount of money, so the differences between these two, would go since the goodwill. Of course, the goodwill is the non current asset under the intangible asset. We're going to put that onto the SFP later on. So, that's the first circumstance where we're going to own 100% of shares of another entity. The second circumstance being if I own 80% of shares of another entity, how are we going to account for goodwill? How are we going to calculate the goodwill, for example? Well, I mean the process is just to be the same. So for example, we're going to pay for another entity $10 and 
the net tusk set of another entity the net tusk set of our other entity for example is to be 5 just to make up a figure so that that would give us the goodwill but it starts straightforward well the answer is no because as you can say in the first circumstance we account for 100% of shares but now we only account for 80% of shares what about the other 20% I said to you if we own more, more than 50% of shares, we've got control. If we've got control, we are the parent, and that will be the subsidiary. But what about for the remaining 20% of shares? Of course, I told you, that will be the NCI, yes? Just to give you a quick example of what's going on for the NCI. So, here's the example. We've got the SFP. Statement financial position. We've got the PBA, which is worth thirty dollars, for example. Uh, you know, of the target company. If we were to acquire that target company, here's the thing. If we were to acquire the target company, all we need to do is that we are going to take all of this PBA of the target company consolidate 100% of that into a consolidated account. That means that the PBA, we are going to put 30 into the consolidated account. But that 30 is only reflecting the 80% of, of ownership over the asset, although we gain 100% of those. So that we need to reflect the 20% of shareholders' interests into a consolidated account as well because you know if you're if, if, if this is not the case of course we are distorting our financial statements isn't it because well we've got 80 percent of shares of, our of the target company although we control 100 percent of those but actually 20 percent of the remaining shares will be belonging to those shareholders who cannot control the company that's called the non-controlling interest so that according to the IFRS number three under the equity section, we also need to reflect this NCI. But how are we going to reflect that NCI? Of course, we're going to use the remaining 20% of shares times this 30, then, which then gives us 6, which will reflect the fact that this will be the amount that is owned by the non controller interest who haven't got control over the company. So that, this is just a basic idea. So. When calculating the goodwill, we are going to compare the payments that the parent's company has made with the net asset to the subsidiary's company. And also we need to plus and other amount that we haven't got control on. That's the NCI. The reason behind it is that this stands for 80% of shares, yes, that we owned over on the entity. But the NCI stands for another 20% of shares. So in this case, I'm going to make an example. So I'm going to assume that that would be 6. So that 10 plus 6 minus 5, which then gives us 11. So that's the good one. Okay, so that's the, just the simple idea behind that. Of course, there will be another way to account for the NCI. So this way to account for the NCI is what I mean by the proportionate method. It is the NCI percentage times the net asset to the subsidiary. Of course, we can use the full goodwill method. It's what we, what we call as the fair value of the NCI. So of course, your examiner would give you normally give you the fair value of the NCI. If that's the case, if the examiner gives you that the fair value of the NCI is six, so you're going to plot that into a goodwill calculation. That's what we've done before. So of course, many of these organisations nowadays, even the IFRS number three, would prefer the full goodwill methods to account for the goodwill, to account for the NCI. 
Of course, we're going to use a lot of techniques to account for the NCI. So for example, we're going to use the black zones option pricing model to value the NCI. Of course, we're going to look at that in the due course. So that's just the basic idea behind the Goodwill calculation, as you can say. Okay. So the next question is, we are going to focus upon the net asset. So you know everything already. So now let's move on to the more advanced bit. It's where we're going to focus upon the net asset. So here's the thing. Because we've got control over now the entity, because we've got, for example, 80% of shares uh, we own uh, within our entity. So when trying to determine the value of the net asset, which value we're going to use? So I'm going to give you a, give you the multiple choice. For example, we're going to use A, 100% uh, of the book value of the net asset. B, we're going to use 100% of the fair value of the net asset. Which one are you going to choose? Of course, the answer for that is B. We are going to use the fair value of the net asset rather than the book value terms. Because book value is not quite relevant, as you can say. Because it has not updated the information at the date that you purchase another company. For example, the land may get revalued during the year. But if you're going to use the book value, of course, uh, that is not relevant to the investor to make the decisions, although it is reliable. But in this particular circumstance, according to IFRS number three, business compilations, we prefer the, uh, you know, the fair value of the net asset rather than the book value terms. So that's just the basic idea behind that. The next thing I'm going to talk to you about is the control definition. So we've understood everything already. So I've talked to you before. Control means we've got more than 50% of shares of another entity. But in the real life, in some of the circumstances that the company may not try to control another entity, may not try to consolidate another entity because the fact that the uh, target company, that the subsidiary, is a loss-making company. So we are not going to consolidate that into our group to make our position worse. But according to the new definition of the control, according to the IFRS number 10, this replaces the old definition of the control. So let's say, what are the elements within the control definition? In order to control another entity, you need to fulfill these three criteria. It's what I mean by par, par value, if you prefer. First P stands for the power instrument. So what do I mean by power instrument? Is that we've got more than 50% of shares of another entity so that we can pass any board resolution we like. But some of the companies, you know, in the early years, may have more than 50% of shares over another entity, but it's still not consolidating that company into a group. Because it said, well, although I've got more than 50% of shares of another entity, but I haven't directed its relevant activity, I haven't made a return, made a positive return out of that company, so that I'm not going to consolidate it, I can't. I'm not going to consolidate the target company. That is okay under the old definition of the control, but under the new definition of the control, this is not okay, because the second idea behind the control is that you're going to control its relevant activity. What do I mean by relevant activity? It is something to do with the strategy, with the cost base of the company. If you're directing the company over those issues, you've got control over another entity. But some of the activities, such as the human resource within the, within the company, the payroll function within the company, although you've got, di although you've got control over that activities, you're not going to control the company because you're not controlling its relevant activity. What you have controlled are just to be the irrelevant activities. As we just talked before, it's the payroll, HR, that kind of thing. It's not going to do with the strategies, for example. 
And the third element within the control definition is the powerful word called return. It is not perfect. Return we can refer to as either it will be positive or negative. Although it's the loss making target company, if you've got power instrument, if you can direct its development activity, you've got control. So if you got control, uh, then what you're going to do is to consolidate the subsidiary into the uh, group financial statement. So if you got control, surely you are called the parents company and this is the subsidiary company and they are within the group. Okay, this means that within the consolidated financial statements, within the consolidated SFP, we are only accounting for the transactions that is outside the group. We are not going to consolidate, we are not going to account for any of these transactions within the group. Because within the group, those are called the related party transactions. It needs to be eliminated. So let me just to give an example of the intergroup transaction. We can call it the related party transaction if you like. So so the parents company buys the subsidiary company. Why this is the case is because, for example, the parents company is going to manufacture the high fashion clothes. Our subsidiary company is going to provide the raw materials, such as the woolen, for example, for the parents company in order to support it to manufacture the high fashion clothes. So that by buying another subsidiary, surely this will achieve synergy. So the parents company gain, for example, 100% of shares of the subsidiary. So the parent is the parent got control, subsidiary is the subsidiary to the group. And after the acquisition, that the parents can play, buys the raw materials from the subsidiary, and the subsidiaries can play sales the raw materials to the parents can play in order to support is uh, you know is uh, high fashion clothes manufacturing process and from this perspective then both uh, for, for, for a subsidiary because we sell something so what we're gonna do you haven't paid for me by cash so we're going to debit the receivable and credit the sales revenue for ten dollars at the same time from a parents company perspective because we buy something from a subsidiary that will be the expense for the company of 10. And we haven't paid for, paid for the subsidiary by cash, so that was payable by 10 as well. It is okay to show these two transactions into each of these financial statements, but it is not okay if we're going to show that into the group account, because I told you before, within the group account, we only show the transaction which is outside the group. So from this perspective then, from this perspective, when it comes to a consolidated account, all we need to do is we're going to plot them together. So we debit the expense, create the payable, and then we debit the receivable, and credit the sales of 10. So firstly, we're going to eliminate directly for the expense and sales revenue. And the second one we're going to do is we're going to reverse the effect of the payable as well as the receivable. If we're going to reverse the effect, we're going to debit to reduce the payable balances by 10. And then we're going to credit the receivable to remove the receivable of $10 as well. Okay, so that's the basic idea behind that. Right, so in recap, what we have done today is that we firstly discuss the issue of control. So just a summary of the control 
is that the idea behind the control or the idea behind the consolidated SFP is based upon these two ideas. Firstly, substance over form. This means that although we've got 80% of shares of another entity, but we control 100% of shares of another entity because the form is just to be we own 80% of shares of another entity. But the substance of this transaction is that we can pass any of this board resolution we want. Okay? So we've got 100% control over the assets and liabilities. So that's why for the assets and liabilities, we are going to account for 100% of those rather than just 80%. The second idea behind a consolidated SFP, it is the single entity concept. This means that we are only accounting for the transaction which is outside the group. Whatever inside the group, surely that has to be eliminated. Of course, in the due course, not only we're we going to talk about the intergroup transaction in more detail, but also we're going to talk about the provision for unrealized profit, dealing with the inventory as well. Of course, there'll be lots more other issues that we're going to talk about with regards to this particular group consolidation, such as the contingency liabilities, such as the deferred tax liabilities as well. So that's just the overview of the control. The second issue related to it, if we're going to uh, go to here, the second element within it is where we're going to discuss the concept called significant influence. So we've got significant influence if we can influence a policy making process of another entity. Normally, if we own more than 20% of shares of another entity, but less than 50% of shares of another entity. But the question is, how are we going to account for it? So the way that we're going to account for the uh, you know, significant influence is where we're going to use the equity accounting. So let me just write down here. So if we've got significant influence over another entity, we're going to use equity accounting method. So, my question is, what do I mean by equity accounting method? So before that, I'd like to show you is that this is the company. It's not a parent's company anymore because we haven't got control over another entity. This is the company one. So that, of course, there's a subsidiary within the group. So here, it is the group, yeah? So this, you know, we've got, for example, 30% of shares of the company one. So that company one is called the associate. The associate, it is outside the group. That's the first idea we need to know. Second is, if we own 30% of shares of the company one, how are we going to account for the company one into group account? So we only show the subsidiary as well as the associate in the group account. We're not going to show the subsidiary as well as the associate in the individual financial statement. So how are we going to account for this particular transaction then? So let me just to give you an example. So for example, at the start of a year, we buy the company shares. We buy 30% of the company shares, company one shares, for $30. So the way we're going to do it is where we're going to debit the investments in associates of 30 and we spend the cash out to buy it of 30. Simple as that. So from this perspective then, you can see that within the SFP, under the non current asset, within the consolidated SFP, under the non current asset, We've got the investments in associate. That is to be fair type. So that's the first transaction we're going to make. But because we bought the other company one, yes, for $30, and we expect the shares to increase in value, 
so that the next year is, for example, the associates company told me that I've made a profit of tax for the total amount of 10. So the associates has made $10 profit of tax during the year. So from this perspective, from our company's perspective, how are we going to account for this? Because we're going to use the equity accounting. So this is where the equity accounting comes in. So equity accounting is where we're going to increase the value of the investments in associates So because the profit of the tax is to be $10, we own 30% of those, that gives us free. But what about for the credit side? Are we going to credit the cash? But well, the answer for that is no. Because you make a gain, fine, because I own 30% of shares of your company, so that 30% of $10 belongs to my company. So that, that would be the gain for our company. So we're going to credit the income from the associate of free. So how are we going to reflect this onto the SFP firstly? Of course, within the SFP, originally we recognised free, but now we're going to plus free. Uh, we originally recognised 30, now we're going to plus free to account for next year's transaction. So that will become 33 of the investments in associates within the non current asset. And at the same time, because we also recognise the income from the associate, so that within the consolidated statement of loss, we are going to show this income from the associate within the consolidated of loss. It's to be free as well. That's what I mean by equity accounting. Okay, so that's it. That's it for this particular video. Uh, we just talked about the basis of the consolidated SFP. We discussed the concept called control as well as the significant influence. APC, accounting for your future.